Um, he's also received a, a Guggenheim Fellowship and he's been a Fulbright Scholar. Um, so when Michael Nachman told the graduate students that we would have the opportunity to invite uh, some scientists to come speak to us this year, he really encouraged us to try to identify scientists who we think are pushing the field of evolutionary biology forward in really interesting ways. And those of you familiar with Rick's work, I think will agree with me that he's not only a very integrative scientist in the true sense of the term, but he's also uh, very innovative and a real forward thinker. So many of us in the museum are probably very familiar with his work on mannequins, which I think he's going to talk a little bit about today. Certainly familiar with his work on the evolution of feathers and feather structure. But Rick has studied a wide variety of topics in biology, including behavior, sexual selection, historical biogeography, um, development. And so when we reached out to him to invite him to speak, we didn't ask him to lecture on any one particular topic. Instead, we, we expressed that we would really like for, for Rick to talk about the work that he's currently the most excited about, in particular the work that he thinks is going to engender the most discussion and potentially debate in the scientific community in the future. So today Rick's going to be talking about the aesthetics theory of evolution, his talk is called The Evolution of Beauty. Um, and he's already confided in me that um, he, he would ideally like to have several hours to give this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously we don't have that much time today, but like Michael mentioned, um, immediately after we're going to have a pizza lunch, and I hope that all the grad students will stick around and we can continue the, the conversation. Also at 5 o'clock today at Beta Lounge, just off campus, we're going to have a cocktail hour and you're all welcome to, to join us. They might freak out if all of us show up, but it's them anyway. Um, and I would encourage you to buy Rick a drink and continue the conversation. <laughs> Uh, one more time on behalf of all the grad students here at NBC, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, already in, uh, in uh, yesterday afternoon and today to uh, revisit this incredibly rich intellectual environment. What a special place this is and it's a, a marvelous to, to, to be here today. Um, uh, of course, what uh, Jeremy didn't emphasize was that Eileen and Michael Nachman and I were all in the exact same cohort at the University of Michigan. Uh, lucky there's no Facebook, Instagram <laughs> record. <laughs> uh, at the same time, I am open to, uh, to, to, to an active game. Uh, who can keep the Nachman stories down? <laughs> Michael's uh, uh, inducements or yours? So, so uh, uh, the grad students, when we go out tonight, we can, we can work on that. Uh, maybe if you buy me too many drinks, then I'll do your really. uh, um, No, it, 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 it's a pleasure, and uh, actually, uh, uh, Michael uh, said to me after I got Jeremy's uh, uh, email invitation, he said, I didn't set this up. I didn't set this up. You're really the gratitude <laughs> choice. And as if I would be offended if he'd set this up. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I have done a lot of stuff in ornithology, but I'm really going back to my roots. I began bird watching because uh, birds were beautiful to me. And what I want to do now is to study uh, another aspect of, science, uh, of, of, of the beauty of birds. The fact that birds evolve because, uh, to be beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves. <coughs> And that this aspect of, uh, of evolutionary biology is deeply Darwinian, is at the core of uh, Darwin's concept of evolutionary biology, and has been essentially laundered out of modern Darwinism. Uh, I think that an aesthetic view of evolution, particularly of communication and ornaments used in social and sexual contexts, is uh, 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 something that will have, uh, uh, or could potentially have a deep impact on how we think about the natural world. And so, uh, even if you don't work in, 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 in sexual selection or in uh, or in uh, communication, I, I think this perspective can tell us a lot about how, uh, how, how biology is. Um, and so, uh, of course, uh, we work on birds. We always got to start with, uh, uh, you know, beautiful and uh, inspiring uh, examples. This is a uh, superb bird of paradise, Lophorina. <laughs> Notice that his eye is actually black. This is a, a lect display uh, video taken by Ed Scholes in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. Ed was my student at Kansas, is now at, uh, uh, at, at Cornell. What we see here is an incredibly complex and integrated display, right, with a, with a structural color. Uh, we have, uh, we're looking at right now, these are all super black, super absorbing feathers around that. Uh, we see a, a, a highly, uh, he's actually making a mechanical sound with his wings. Uh, there are am amazing muscles used to, to raise those feathers in that, in that fashion. Uh, uh, a, a truly complicated and, uh, and, and, and... Now, of course, this also tells us something important, which is that the happy face was not invented in Berkeley uh, by the 60s popular culture, but evolved independently in the uh, Papua New Guinea and entirely other uh, lineage. 
these kinds of uh, of of, uh, of of displays, like this parodia, also taken by uh, by Ed, uh, have uh, are fitting into currently into what uh, referred to as an adaptive mate choice uh, uh, paradigm. That is, that ornament in nature is reducible to meaning, to meaning about quality. So that when we look at the sum of this extraordinarily complicated and integrated uh, 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 display. What we're seeing is like a biological match.com profile of everything <laughs> that a female needs to know. You know, who are his people? Uh, does he come from a good egg? Uh, uh, does he have sexually transmitted diseases? Uh, you know, uh, uh, how's his diet? Uh, you know, uh, does he smoke or, or even what is he smoking? Uh, all, all sorts of questions. But of course, as everyone knows about computer dating, whoops, sorry, that's a lot. Uh, everybody lies, right? And what's the effect of, of lying? Well, that's one of the things I want to probe. So, for example, in this guy, the, the Three Bottle Bellbird, which has a extremely complicated song, which you guys can hear, but I can't. Is it still playing? Okay, yeah. Okay, there it is. Uh, um, he has these bizarre uh, Fu Manchu style, weird, wormy, waddly things. What's going on? Well, the sister group actually has a single one, uh, a, a novel ornament. And these guys uh, have this sort of ectopic novel expression of these two additional wormy waddles on the side of it. This is the kind of complexity that, that I think uh, is, uh, as I'll argue, um, is unexplainable or poorly explained by, by, by the honest signaling paradigm. Here is another bird, a, a clubwing mannequin. This guy's actually singing with his wings. That's a stridulation where the wing feathers are rubbing against one another to produce that ringing sound. It's a cricket-winged mannequin, indeed, right? So what I, what I want to do is, from those examples, is to dive into some theory and think how we, have we been thinking about this and how should we think about it and, and how would that structure science. In particular, I want to draw a, a contrast between uh, those kinds of functions, uh, uh, biotic functions that, that are a result of natural selection on physical properties of the material. Uh, and those that function on neural cognitive functions of the same biotic materials. So, for example, we can compare the plant's roots, which you can describe completely in terms of the interaction between those, uh, those roots and describable aspects of the physical environment, whether it's the substrate, holding the substrate, <coughs> absorbing water, absorbing nutrients, etc. Right? Uh, and maybe there are biotic interactions uh, with mycorrhizae, etc., but those, again, are, 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 are entirely describable. In contrast, the other aspects of the of the plant, this uh, the flower, uh, is functioning in an entirely different way. It's functioning essentially through the ecological seduction of another individual. It's functioning through its the neural and cognitive impression created by that flower on the nervous system. And I think that this is essentially a watershed. This is like a, a, two different distinct kinds of phenomena happening here. So natural selection acting on physical function and aesthetic selection acting on neural and cognitive functions. And so we have a great story uh, about natural selection, for example, on the continuous uh, variation we see in, in the, the beaks of Galapagos finches. But what I want to entertain is what's going on on the opposite side with the uh, exquisite variation in coloration patterns uh, in these male cotingus, which are functioning through social selection based on sensory impressions. So this, I think, is a rather broad uh, application, sensory uh, or aesthetic evolution is going to ha be happening in whenever you have essentially biotic seduction as the nature of the interaction, right? Where uh, either in social signaling, sexual signaling, uh, fruit and, and frugivore interactions or pollinator interactions, also aposematism, uh, uh, beauty is not the only aesthetic property in nature. Uh, there can be a, even uh, evolved revulsion. So what I would like to introduce is the idea of the concept of aesthetic evolution. And I think it's about the subjective experiences of organisms. Now, by this, I'm really, it's, we're getting quite philosophical, or we, we need to. It, these are the currently indescribable and immeasurable qualities of the sensory and cognitive experiences of individual <coughs> organisms. And what I mean, what I hope to propose is that just because uh, these things are difficult to study doesn't mean that they're irrelevant. And that our fear of doing science on them doesn't make them less uh, rather, and, and indeed, the, what, I, what I propose is that these uh, forces are actually, or these are actually real forces in nature. So uh, we may not be able to measure subjective experience directly, but we can also study it comparatively, because, in my opinion, frequently these subjective experiences co-evolve with the stimuli that elicit these reactions. That is, uh, a co-evolution of, of, of sexual ornament and sexual preferences. 
uh, we can, by comparing species, actually see how subjective experiences have evolved over time. And that, indeed, this is sort of like studying electrons. People in physics didn't stop because it was difficult to solve for the problem, or impossible to solve for the problem, of the position and velocity simultaneously of the electron. They didn't say, oh, throw up their hands and stop doing science. Uh, we shouldn't either. And in fact, uh, subjective experiences have a huge impact on evolutionary biology, or on the evolution of biodiversity, and that they should be a primary study uh, subject of our study. So I think aesthetic evolution is an emergent property of three conditions. That is sensory perception, uh, cognitive evaluation, uh, and choice. And th those choices can have social or sexual uh, consequences, and then the potential for, uh, for evolution. I think for the most part, aesthetic evolution involves co-evolution of a signal uh, and its evaluation. This hedge is uh, against a large and complicated discussion of sensory bias, which I'd be glad to get into, but which I'm going to ignore for today's talk. Uh, so one of the things that this implies is that for every evolved ornament in nature, there is an elaborate and co-evolved cognitive preference. So whether it's the peacock's tail or the argus pheasant or any of those uh, amazing ornaments in nature, there is some other individual uh, who has internally uh, a, a, a psychological or cognitive preference that has been uh, a, a, the, the causal agent in the evolution of those extremities. So what is beauty? The B word. One of my goals is to bring beauty back into the sciences as a legitimate study, a scientific study, and so I need a good definition. I think beauty is one possible aesthetic property, that is the, uh, a quality or a qualitative description of the, of the, of the mode of the sensory response to, to a signal. Uh, and in this case, it's a co-evolved cognitive experience produced by aesthetic evolution. I think beauty is a subjective experience of the co-evolution or, or of a co-evolved attraction. That is, beauty occurs when the desire for it, it has co-evolved with the thing that is desired. And I'm going to also introduce the word desire as a, as a scientific term because I think it's actually informative to getting us to understand uh, 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 the role of these, the, the, these processes in, in, in nature. So uh, beauty is a positive aesthetic response. It's not the only one. For example, in aposematism, we have co-evolved revulsion, uh, uh, which would which be aesthetically a different kind of uh, aesthetic property. And again, bringing beauty back. Well, why bring beauty back? Because it was central to evolution originally, right? Charles Darwin uh, has this marvelous quote, the sight of the feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze it, it makes me sick. In a letter to Asa Gray, and if you look at this picture, he looks a little sick, right? <laughs> he was a sickly guy. But, 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 uh, but indeed, this was a conundrum. Of course, when he proposed natural selection, the idea of ornament was quickly seized on by most of the critics, to, uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, 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 um, implied that there were serious problems with the, with a theory that explained evolution solely on the basis of survival because there were many ornaments that, that had no role in it. Of course, he proposed a detailed uh, theory of, of sexual selection in his book, Descent of Man, and, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, he proposed uh, 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 what, what particular features I want to emphasize is that he proposed that sexual selection is distinct from natural selection, something that I hope you all will consider as uh, one possible thing to remember from this talk is, uh, is, is that, that notion and that, 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 that maybe Darwinism ought to be constructed in, in the way that Darwin might have thought it should be. Uh, that uh, ornaments evolve by mate choice and that he used aesthetic language to describe ornamentation and uh, mating preferences. For example, he described female mating preferences as a taste for the beautiful or as standards of beauty or uh, that females had an aesthetic faculty. And of course, he described male displays uh, uh, exhibiting a power to charm the female. And just as, a, as an aside, of course, uh, we all know, and I, uh, in, in, with greater time, could go into all the details of the kind of variations that occur in breeding system, whereas uh, obviously we can have uh, 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 male choice on female ornaments and all sorts of different other circumstances. For the most part, I'll be, I'll be simplifying the discussion today by talking about uh, uh, mating preferences, usually female, and displays, usually male. Now, another thing that's interesting about Darwin's theory was that it was thoroughly co-evolutionary. So, for example, he described uh, this beautiful bird, the Argus pheasant. Uh, the male Argus pheasant, uh, pheasant acquired his beauty gradually through the preference of females during many generations uh, for more highly ornamented males. The aesthetic capacity of females advanced through exercise or habit, just as our own taste gradually improved. So, he saw the two of them in some kind of mutual interaction changing and transforming one another over time. And he didn't have a genetic theory, so, but these statements are as lucid uh, a lucid description as co-evolution as his description of natural selection were uh, without a theory of, uh, of genetic theory. So I think he was right there uh, in, in many ways with the, 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 the way I would uh, frame it today. 
Uh, of course, this theory was considered to be Darwin's great failure. And in the centenary or the bicentenary of his birth that we celebrated recently, uh, there was, as far as I know, no celebrations of Darwin's uh, thought of mate choice and aesthetic component, what he really thought uh, of mate choice as, as part of that. And I, I think that's unfortunate. Why does that happen? Well, because uh, Darwin's view of mate choice was, it was heavily criticized, and his, one of his chief critics was Wallace. I'll just focus on Wallace's criticisms. Wallace provided many creative arguments against the likelihood of sexual selection by mate choice. One of them that I think is sort of perversely creative is he argued that when you open up the body, you know, the spleen and the liver are all brilliantly colored. Well, why shouldn't the feathers be brilliantly colored too? It's just a, it's just a manifestation of the, of the vigor of the animal, which, remember the vigor, that's going to become important in how people interpret this today. Uh, but uh, he, and he argued that males are drab because there's natural selection against their being, or females are drab because there's natural selection against their being brilliant, like males, often due to parental care. Uh, but Wallace was never able to fully reject evolution by mate choice. And in those passages where he did entertain the possibility, he made extraordinarily interesting statements. Here in a book, uh, Natural Selection in Tropical Nature, he said, uh, in, a, in a section entitled Natural Selection Neutralizing Sexual Selection, the only way in which we can account for the observed facts, and that is the, 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 these ornaments that, 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 that may have evolved by, by sexual selection, by mate choice, is by supposing that color and ornament are strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. This statement would be at home in almost every single paper on sexual selection written in the last 40 years. Right? This is, an ex I mean, Dar Wallace is credited with having killed sexual selection, but in fact, he stated it in its most explicit modern form. Uh, uh, exactly. Now, he also went on to say, well, how did he win this? He won it because he rhetorically changed what, what sexual selection was. He defined it as a kind of natural selection and therefore defined it away. If there is, as I maintain, such a correlation, then sexual selection for color and ornament, for which there is little or no evidence, becomes needless because natural selection, which is the emitted varic cause, will produce all the results. So the intellectual defeat of sexual selection was a result of saying it's nothing more than natural selection, so we can proceed by excluding this from our, from our lexicon. And here's the statement that really is the fingerprints on, on what happened. This is from a book, Darwinism. Uh, Darwin has been dead for six years. Wallace would live until 1914 for decades more to strongly characterize what, what evolutionary biology became. In his book called Darwinism, he says, even in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist on the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is, the preeminently, uh, this is preeminently the Darwinian doctrine, and therefore I claim for my book the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. Right? So this is the fact that Wallace may have lost the battle for priority in describing who natural selection, or, you know, in, as credit for claiming natural selection as his own theory. But he won the war over what natural selection was going to become in the 20th century, which is this, based entirely on this concept the insistence of the efficacy of natural selection. This is the birth of adaptationism, at which uh, it, it deeply affects the science and the way we're doing now. So this is the end of Darwin's concept of, you know, the tree of life, the role of development. <coughs> Evo Devo has been shut out of, uh, of, with this statement. Uh, 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 an aesthetic form of selection. Basically, all the things that I've ever worked on in my life. Right? <laughs> and so as we celebrate that, I'm still pissed off about this, <laughs> this sentence, right? Because, and I, and I, and I think we've been, we've been robbed of our real Darwinism, and, and neo-Darwinism uh, really, really uh, tried to drive this home. And, it's, and, and one of the reasons why, I, don't, I mean, why should we care about this, in, this historical framework at all? One of the reasons is that Darwinism is still, neo-Darwinism is still an edifice in our, in our field. Uh, and uh, um, so this is sort of tr a trump card to try to take it, take it down uh, from, from this perspective. So, of course, nearly a century passed in which the, state, the discussion of, uh, of mate choice, evolution by mate choice, was almost impossible. Uh, it was rediscovered in the early 70s, not surprisingly to me, uh, during a, a wave of sudden uh, feminist political change in the nation. Right? How, is that an accident that, uh, uh, you know, Sexual selection by mate choice was not discussed between mostly in the scientific context between 1871 and 1971. Uh, what happened in 1971? That might have changed. If people think that maybe females had uh, had uh, uh, mo you know interior uh, motivations. I, I, I think that this was a, a cultural to science feedback uh, effect. Well, it early congealed around this notion 
of, of honest advertisement uh, through the handicap model proposed by uh, Zahavi. We can see that Zahavi was actually ignorant of this history. He says, well, it's dismissed altogether the theory of sexual selection by mate choice, but in that same original paper he suggested, I suggest that sexual selection is, an effective, is effective because it improves the ability of the selecting sex to detect the quality of the selected sex. This is an explicitly Wallacean statement and, and, uh, and, and became essentially uh, though filtered through some uh, changes, you know, what modern uh, 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 um, sexual selection had become. Okay, so what he proposed, of course, is this notion that quality information is encoded in the handicap. Uh, the handicap is a handicap because it requires investment. It's the ante that, re that allows the or, uh, individual to, 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 to demonstrate his quality. Uh, the cost ensures the honesty by preventing low-quality males from producing the counterfeit. But, and what this was the, uh, the rebirth of Wallacean idea that all beauty is utility, that is, it is about uh, improvement. And I won't get into it, but I think this is still uh, a, a deeply eugenic uh, notion, if not matched with some other kind of uh, a possibility like a null model. So, uh, um, what do I think of the handicap principle? Well, we all remember this slogan, you know, with a name like Smuckers, it's got to be good, right? This, uh, this jelly, and, and uh, uh, maybe I'm revealing too much, but uh, you know, scientifically, decades later, I realized there were actually advantages to spent at least part of my childhood uh, stoned late on Saturday nights watching Saturday Night Live. Because I'm sure some of you will remember this great uh, classic ad from 1978 where Jane Curtin comes out and she says, with a name like Fluckers, it's got to be good. <laughs> and then Dan Agro says, no, wait, wait, we've got a new jelly. It's called Nose Hair. <laughs> With a name like Nose Hair, it's got to be good, right? And then the Belushi comes out and was like, whoa, it's called Death Camp. Look at that barbed wire on the label. Mm, that's great. And the next one is Chevy Chase going out. Here it is. It's called Painful Rectal Itch. Now, with a name like that, it's got to be good, right? Well, why would I expose you to this, this low level of comedy? Because I think it's exactly what Zahavi is about. The fact of the matter, what Zahavi misses and laundered out of the analysis is that there are no jellies called painful rectal itch. And why is that? Because it's about aesthetics. It's about attracting the senses of, and seducing the senses of another individual. Right? And in fact, this, this, that it is always true that, uh, that the revulsion of, of, of a name like that is going to be directly correlated with any possible quality. And so, you know, there's a deep, deep problem with, 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 this, with this Ahavian uh, uh, handicap. And I think that, uh, I hope that you all think of Smucker's Jelly whenever you hear it again. So, uh, gloss over the state of the current research. What I want to say, you know, since Ahavi, we've had a clear statement that he made of how preferences evolve, how mate preferences should evolve, uh, and the, the current sort of classification will be, you know, direct benefits, uh, 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 acting, so, so uh, uh, encoding meaning about good parental care or food or, or a few sexually transmitted diseases, etc., or indirect gen gen genetic benefits like good genes. And this is sort of the framework that, that is currently being used, and, and this supports the biomatch.com uh, concept, right? <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, almost all research is, is, uh, is uh, of this variety today. Most researchers work, I think, to confirm this story rather than to test it. That is, if you don't find that, uh, that your, uh, the repertoire size of house wrens or you know, this or that plumage ornament is actually an indicator of quality, it means you haven't worked hard enough yet. And there's no other alternative but going back to work. Because what everybody looks for in a dissertation in behavioral ecology is the exquisite new example that shows what we already know to be true in some deeply neat and new, <laughs> unexpected way. Right? And that is what everybody's trying to achieve. Right? And there's, most of it is, is, is frankly close to faith-based in the sense that, uh, that uh, they are really, really know that there has to be meaning in these traits, but they're unwilling to entertain the possibility that it's not there. And, and, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a deep problem. So how do we counter this? I advocate that we return to a fully aesthetic uh, Darwinian alternative. Uh, what's at the heart of that is, um, you know, an explicitly Darwinian theory, uh, first cooked up by, by Fisher in the, in the teens and 30s, uh, and then uh, 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 mathematically demonstrated and rigorously worked out by Russell and Mark Kirkpatrick in, in the 80s. And this is something that I've been kicking around since uh, you know, the month I met Eileen and Michael Bachman and uh, in <laughs> so so uh, so uh, here it is, and uh, I, I'm just going to go dive through this uh, uh, kind of quickly. 
uh, at the heart of this is, uh, is the evolution of, 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 of display and preference in a population. This is a mean display and mean preference in a population. So at every point in the graph would be the, the state of an individual population. And moving across the, the graph would be you know, evolution in the, in the state of the, uh, the population. The, the, the model assumes genetic variation in, in a display trait and a mating preference. Um, and, and, and as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, Fisher pointed out, trait evolution is easy to understand. I don't know if this has a deep uh, uh, Freudian impacts either. You know, males are simple. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in this case, what, 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 uh, what uh, the model implies is that, well, uh, how display should evolve is quite simple in the sense that every male should evolve, to, it, with all other things being equal, to what the mean female prefers or the average male preference, and that's this sexual selection optimum in the, the, the large dash line. Of course, there might be at some intermediate display, say these are short tails and long tails, there might be some intermediate state that is preferred by survive, by natural selection. That is, if you're too short, uh, your tails are too short, you might not be able to feed appropriately, fly to feed, and, and if your tail's too long, you get eaten by tigers, and, and so uh, <laughs> the, 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 the equilibrium between these two forces acting on males will be a line of equilibrium um, between the sexual advantage and the survival advantage. So, uh, if you up here, you could be highly sexy, but you're not uh, 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 living long enough to benefit from it. You get eaten by a tiger too early. And, and if you're down here, you may be perfectly adapted and never get a mate. Uh, and as a result, uh, you, 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 there'd be some, some intermediate. And the point here is that, that there's, a, there's, there's a broad uh, uh, set, or basically an infinite number of solutions to, to uh, um, this problem. Now, how do preferences evolve? This is the deeply more complicated issue. Uh, if we start now in this diagram, we're looking at uh, individuals. This is, uh, if, if we could experimentally uh, look at, the, at, at genes in the context of, uh, uh, of both males and females, the, the, each individual is going to have genes for preference that it's carrying, as well as genes for traits, regardless of whether it's uh, 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 male or female. So if we look at this, uh, this, this general uh, uh, correlation or null model, what we'd imagine is that because uh, preferences actually select on display, we would get the evolution of a covariation or a correlation, genetic correlation between genes for trait and preference merely by the existence of their activities. So there'd be lots of, of matings in this and this quadrant because females who prefer long tails are going to mate with males that have long tails and vice versa. But there'll be very few matings in these two quadrants and the result will be the evolution of a correlation between them. What that means is that when females select on traits, they are also selecting also on preference. Preference is the engine of the evolution of preference, right? Uh, and that's why it's, it's, it's basically a, a self-organized process. So when you put these two together, you get the famous Landy diagrams where populations are going to evolve toward the line of equilibrium in the dimension in which uh, variation, genetic variation is available. That is uh, close to or related to that, that, that line of correlation. Uh, what this means as well is that uh, organisms or populations that, that drift off the line are going to be displaced to new equilibria. So it's unstable. So this is the origin of essentially an aesthetic normativity. What ought somebody to like and what ought somebody to, to what kind of aesthetic traits ought somebody to produce, but shows that it's a self-organizing but also destabilizing process. Uh, and of course this can be connected to the runaway situation where the co correlation is extremely strong and I won't spend time on those details. So uh, what I'm proposing is that the really way to look at these two things is that, that the, uh, that the uh, Landy Kirkpatrick model is really the null hypothesis, the non-adaptive <laughs> null. Uh, it, within this model, the traits and preferences are arbitrary. That is, they have no encoded meaning. They only have the opportunity to cor be correlated or not with the traits that are selecting on them. Right? Uh, traits and success is, in, in, is independent of any extrinsic, extrinsic variable, like the ability to get food, the ability to get uh, uh, you know, the right nutrients in your diet, uh, whether you came from a good egg or not. Uh, and that in this case, the evolution of beauty, uh, which this is what we co-evolved attraction, is a self-organizing process. It's merely a consequence of the existence of preferences uh, and the things that they evolve to like. So mating preferences desire are the agents, uh, the evolutionary agents, the forces in the evolution of preferences. And uh, I would describe this null as beauty happens. Right? It is merely a consequence of sensory uh, perception, uh, cognitive evaluation, and choice. So, of course, the disturbance in equilibrium includes lots of diversity. Uh, this contributes to differentiation and potentially speciation among traits. Multiple traits, so you get complicated uh, 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 you know, repertoires of traits, etc. 
And I think that this also, with the also possibility, and this comes right out of the models, that there's an opportunity for evolution of decadence, right? The whole population can get aesthetically so extreme that they become rare or even extinct, right? And this is something that's uh, deeply possible, and uh, by adopting the null, I think we can sort of inoculate uh, mate choice and uh, behavioral ecology from what are truly our eugenic roots by, by adopting the fact that, you know, evolution can be decadent. Uh, how does natural selection fit into all this? Well, I think that if you imagine, again, another dimension, natural selection acting on female preferences, then you can produce the good genes or on a signaling uh, properties. And what those will do is close down this, this line of equilibrium to a single point or to a reduced amount of variation, and that will result in shutdown of the dynamics. Now, since the 90s, I've been talking about how this process should shut down diversity, how honest signaling implies that diversity of ornament should be less than, than or equivalent to other traits under natural selection. Therefore, the bird plumage should be as variable as the size of bird beaks. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole set of macroevolutionary predictions that that, uh, that could fly out of this that, that I think could be tested but, but aren't being. So how do we think about all this? Uh, is beauty only utility? Well, I think the, the way to, to, to arrange these two models is to imagine that the aesthetic choice is the null. The LK mechanism is the null, uh, Laney Kirkpatrick, is the null hypothesis, the evolution of mate choice, and this null hypothesis can't be proven, it can only be rejected. And the burden of proof is to demonstrate that natural selection on preference is acting on preference, not vice versa. That is, uh, most people believe that just because uh, mating and reproduction are costly, that there that means that there's natural selection having our preference. Well, you know, uh, there's some other news. You know, we're all going to die someday, and the fact that we're all going to die does not mean that we're under natural selection, right? There are limits, and yet, uh, you know, natural selection has to be demonstrated. So, uh, essentially, uh, when this was cooked up, the the, the, the fisherian camp just sort of packed up their bags and folded. But in fact, what really needs to be demonstrated is whether or not there's natural selection on preference, whether or not there's this dimension, this added dimension that is specifically producing honest or or or, or uh, uh, advertisements. So how do we uh, how do we test these hypotheses, or how do we uh, reject the null? Well, it's going to be difficult. Uh, Fisher said in his very first paper, you know, that examining this genetic or finding this genetic correlation. It, uh, is going to be difficult uh, at equilibrium, and uh, you know, uh, my bet is that you know maybe the best way to do it would be to experimentally establish uh, populations of say Drosophila that are far from the line of equilibrium and s see how they evolve. Uh, but uh, but finding that natural population is going to be very difficult. This is what we really need to do. We need to to test for natural selection on mating choice. We need to <coughs> establish whether females that prefer sweet, sweet, sweeter than sweet are actually in a natural selection compared to females that prefer, prefer you know, sweet, 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 I'll switch you. Uh, and, and now we just assume that that's true and that those things must be about uh, honesty, but uh, uh, we can't do so. Uh, and on, also there's this other detail of how, how Zahavi was saved by assuming nonlinear cost to trade production. Um, and these remain essentially entirely untested by the, by the whole field. So the conclusion from this part, what I want to get is to return to Darwin's idea that natural and sexual selection are distinguished or distinctive processes. And, 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 and half the, part of the problem goes to, goes to the definition of fitness. When Darwin uh, used the word fitness, he meant fit to perform a specific task, you know, crack a nut, you know, migrate, <laughs> fight for a nest site. It was fitness was had the same like fitness center. It has the same thing that fitness does in the, in the, wild, in the world at large. But with the origin of population genetics, and also during the era when mate choice was considered to be ridiculous, Darwin's failed idea, uh, fitness was redefined in a particular population genetic contest in a way that confounded the independent contributions of differential survival and differential mating success. So this means that the very words of use of fitness and its association with the word of natural selection even prevents us from even being able to articulate ways in which selection could be operating but not be adaptive, right? And I think that's really deeply at the prob heart of the problem. Uh, and so uh, we're prevented of conceiving of these terms by our modern vocabulary. We can't even think the way Darwin did. So uh, if selection is the result of a covariance between variation in trait and variation in fitness, Natural selection, of course, it requires this additional correlation between some trait and some extrinsic factor, some extrinsic functional thing. This goes back to, again to G.C. Williams' notion of how we actually test an adaptive hypothesis by reference to some other explicit functional uh, 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 scenario. 
So arbitrary sexual selection occurs when the trait variation is uncorrelated with any extrinsic factor, but merely uh, with, uh, with the causal agency of it. And because these are intrinsic to the population, I think of it as a, as a distinct kind of uh, uh, phenomenon. So defining sexual selection as a form of natural selection requires redefining arbitrary decadence as a form of adaptation. The current solution is cognitively dissonant. I would compare this to uh, the idea of defining genetic drift as random fitness. Uh, you know, this is, this is obviously true. Uh, and yet, uh, it's conceptually so jarring that people ah, you refuse to do it. Well, uh, you know, the, the, how do we avoid this cognitive dissonance? Well, the way we do it is to separate sexual and natural selection definition uh, from each other. So I would recognize sexual selection as a distinct evolutionary mechanism along with mutation, recombination, drift, and natural selection. And, and I hope that you I commend this uh, to your attention. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay. So at this point, what I would normally do, good, I guess I found. At this point, what I would normally do is go into uh, various aspects of what I call beauty studies, right? And this is like the deep biology of like, oh, what we're doing in the lab this week, and, and there's just lots and lots of fun stuff in here. But uh, in order to get to yet another aspect of the impact of aesthetic evolution on, on, on behavioral ecology, I want to gloss over these. So we could be talking about sexual uh, or uh, sexual dimorphic. Uh, uh, structural colors like these uh, spongy medullary colors and bird feathers, uh, or uh, some of the work we're doing. Whoops! This is uh, this is X-ray tomographic data set from that Parodia Bird of Paradise, the one with the tutu and the ballerina dance, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, of the uh, the uh, iridescent throat feathers showing the shape of the barbule. So we're doing basically deep physics on on. Uh, uh, on, 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 on the control of the angle of observation. Uh, recently, I've gotten into pigments. So this is the Pompadour Katinga, uh, and we've been doing stuff characterizing its, uh, its it, their carotenoid plumages, uh, and discovered six new carotenoids to nature, these methoxy carotenoids, which have not been found anywhere else on the planet. And with my grades in organic chemistry, I'm the last person that should be doing this work. But you know, when it's about purple, suddenly it's really fascinating. Uh, though we've been working on broadbills, and discovered three more carotenoids. This, this paper is just impress. Uh, three more novel carotenoids to the planet. And in, in these cases, um, uh, we've expanded the known carotenoids in avian feathers by something like a, a third in the last five years. Uh, so obviously, the folks that have been doing carotenoid research from an honest advertisement perspective for a long, long time uh, have been missing some of the biology or some of the organic chemistry. Uh, why is that? We've been doing stuff on, on tetrachromatic. Since beauty is at least partly mediated by the eye of the observer, we're interested in how birds see and how they perceive that, that aspect of the equation. That's led to the development of a tetrahedral color space to describe avian perceptions where different kinds of colors are distributed uh, based on the relative simulation of the four cones within the Within the, within the bird uh, visual system, and uh, describing the gamut or the complete possibility of bird colors. Uh, I have been looking at mimicry. Uh, these are hairy and downy woodpecker who are unrelated in the genus Pacoides. Their plumages are convergent. I've been identifying dozens of examples of this in, in birds of the world. Uh, and with the uh, help of Larry Samuelson, a game theorist in the economics department of Yale, we produced a, an expansion of the hawk dove game, which we call the hairy downy game. The object here is actually that if people get into game theory, they'll be forced to learn about woodpeckers. And I just find that, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know uh, well, well, perversely attractive that these, uh, that these economists will have to learn what's the woodpecker, what's that, you know. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'd love to talk about that. Um, and we've been working on this guy again. Uh, showing that this uh, is a, in this genus is a novel origin of culture. Uh, these are the only subossians that learn their birds, learn their songs, the bellbirds, four species. Where in this one in particular, uh, there has a deep, deep uh, um, uh, 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 novelty in how they how they learn songs. Uh, we've also been working on fossil aesthetics. So in the lab, in collaboration with folks at Yale, we've established that melanosomes fossilize really well. Uh, and we've been using that to reconstruct the color of dinosaurs. This is a feathered dinosaur that is not a bird. Uh, and uh, this is Anchorinus huxleyi. And, and that leads to a really deeply interesting question, which is the potential role of aesthetics in the evolution of the planar vein of the original feather, which was later co-opted in flight. So that bird beauty, or dinosaur beauty, may have had a critical role in the evolution of feathers, which later facilitated the evolution of flight. So that's a pretty uh, important uh, uh, impact. 
Where I want to go now, though, in the final minutes is talk about a new aspect of the work, another aspect of the work, and that is sexual conflict. Um, a lot of, uh, these are actually uh, uh, love bites. These are puffins. They get along great. So these are, they're not fighting. Uh, um, there are a lot of birds that, uh, 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 that, or reproduction in general requires at least nominally some cooperation uh, for gamete combination to have. There's, uh, there's common interests, obviously. And yet, of course, there's a lot of dissimilar interests. And so this area is referred to as sexual conflict. And sexual conflict is a result of the divergent evolutionary, evolutionary interests of the sexes and can arise over mating, over parental care, parental investment, and all that sorts of aspects of, of reproduction. So some birds, like, uh, like uh, these puffins, have relatively little. But in other species, sexual conflict can really be a, a strong impact. So for example, uh, sexual conflict over mating uh, can result in sexual coercion, where uh, one sex, usually males, will organize uh, the use of force or the threat of force against the other individuals to increase their probability of fertilization. And, and this particular aspect can uh, give rise, uh, uh, sexual in this case, frequently occurs between, uh, between sexual selection for male competition and mate, mate choice. That is, there can be an equilibrium between female efforts to choose among variable males and female control over fertilization versus males' uh, coercion. And that can be, there's often a, a, some equilibrium between those forces. Well, we've been working on this in the lab for a number of years with Patty Brennan, now at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, uh, on, on ducks. And this is uh, you know, uh, uh, deeply problematic, deeply uh, uh, um, uh, fascinating research, but also uh, with, uh, I think, a really important impact for evolutionary biology. So in ducks, they're male, in most ducks, they're male-female form pairs. Females uh, choose mates on the base of displays, that is, we have uh, a choice mating system going on. But waterfowl, one of the few, organi a few birds that still have a penis, it's homologous with the, the mammalian penis, but with lots of, uh, of fascinating anatomical differences. Forced copulation, which is essentially rape, uh, are common in species with dense breeding populations. And the duck penis has correlated uh, in, uh, in size, evolution is correlated with the frequency of forced copulations. Females exercise mate choice, but greatly resist those forced copulations and the forced copulations can be extremely costly immediately to, to the birds. Uh, the, the effect of this process is, 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 is quite astounding. <coughs> this is the Argentine lake duck showing the largest penis uh, for its body size of any vertebrate animal. Uh, this is a rather small duck with a very large penis. Uh, what is that doing? Why? How could that be? Well, Patty Brennan in the lab figured this out. What she showed is that in most species, in species of ducks that have a small penis, these are dissected. I don't have time to go through all the anatomy. This is the female oviduck, and this is the, 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 the penis of, of, a, of, a, of an eider uh, and a goose, uh, showing the very simple oviduck when there are small penises. But the, when the penis is large, you get a very complex oviduck. The penis it has uh, you know, uh, lymphatic erection, uh, instantaneous erection, it, it averts into the female reproductive tract, it doesn't get stiff. But what happens is, in, in these cases, that the females have co-evolved a complex vaginal morphology. What is that doing? Well, it has several features to it. The first is, are these cul-de-sac uh, dead ends, that is, they're off-pocketings, right, in the vaginal tract. The others are upstream of those, you get a, a coiling in the vaginal tract, but they are clockwise coils instead of the penis having a, a counterclockwise coil. So these are literally anti-screw devices. <laughs> and we've done a lot, we've done at least some uh, 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 experimental behavior demonstrating this. So these are the non-phylogenetically controlled uh, graphs which showing that penis length and, uh, correlates with, in the species with the number of pouches and with the number of spirals, so that these two things are co-evolving dynamically. What's going on? Well, in high densities, Ducks uh, evolve uh, this coercive strategy. Females evolve complex vaginal morphologies. The vaginal cul-de-sacs and clockwise spirals are extraordinarily effective at reducing uh, fertilization success by forced copulation. Uh, when, when there's 40% uh, copulation, extra pair copulation or forced copulation rates, the paternity rate for those extra pair copulations is 2 to 5%. Right? So they're very good at this. What this is is an arms race, a sexually antagonistic arms race in, in, in genital evolution. Um, so what's going on? Well, I think the way to imagine this is by returning to Darwinian concept of sexual autonomy. In particular, uh, duck vaginal morphology is evolved through the indirect benefits of sexual autonomy. What's happening is that if a female gets the male she desires, then her male offspring will inherit the traits she likes and that other females share a preference for. If she's forcibly fertilized, her male offspring will inherit either a random trait 
or a trait that's spe specifically rejected by other females, right? So there's a genetic cost in terms of her fitness to whether or not her offspring will be sexually attractive based on whether or not she exercises her choice, that is, what I call sexual autonomy, or uh, is, 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 uh, is the subject of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, forced copulation. So I think in this case what's happened is the vaginal morphologies have expanded the sexual autonomy, the capacity of females to control reproduction in the face of sexual coercion. And this leads to a whole, uh, what I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll cut out soon, this leads to what I call, would, would, would characterize as a deeply feminist discovery in the heart of evolutionary biology. It's not like creating a, 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 a biology that matches political uh, preconceptions. What is it saying that we need to construct evolutionary biology to realize that females, individuals, or all individuals, have evolved uh, 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 um, uh, um, you know, preferences over their own behaviors. And that one of the aspects of synonymizing sexual selection with natural selection is, is saying, well, it's all going to work out. If natural selection is the handmaiden of, of uh, or sexual selection is the handmaiden of, of adaptation, that we don't need to imagine females as agents in their own evolution. Natural, we already got a theory of natural selection to express that. But what we really need to realize is that those sexual selection is not the same as natural selection, and that there's this force of sexual autonomy. Well, uh, there's a lot of people who don't want to hear this news. Well, this is a clip uh, from Fox News covering our research, but I guess fortunately we'll all be benefited. We don't have to see that. <laughs> so, so uh, I propose that we evolutionary biology needs this new concept of sexual autonomy is the capacity of an individual organism to pursue its individual mate choice preferences without sexual coercion. Uh, I'll just go rapidly now. I would apply this in another kind of mechanism, what I call aesthetic remodeling. The bower is an aesthetic structure that males uh, bowerbirds make in response to female choice. It's obviously aesthetic and architectural. This bowerbird has actually got fossil shells. So this is a, <laughs> want to come up and see my fossil collection? <laughs> right? But what happens is that during the display, the female sits in there and the male sits out front. And, and if he tries to copulate, he has to go around the bower, which gives the female the chance to leave if she doesn't want to mate. So she's created an aesthetic ornament which expands her capacity to maintain control. I call this aesthetic remodeling. She's remaking maleness in, in a way that, if, that extends her capacity to get what she wants, right? And I think this is something that we, we need to deeply consider. And I, and I also, uh, all this architecture in Bowerbirds is evolving to expand and to ensure uh, autonomy while, while getting stimulus. And the other example, of course, is lecking. The tragedy of the common should apply to every lek. Every single male, uh, 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 relative fitness will be advance if he disrupts every other female visit that he possibly sees, right? So the lek should collapse under the tragedy of the commons unless we have cooperation. And so lek evolution is about the evolution of male-male cooperation. How does males going to cooperate with males? Only if females demand it. So the lek is not, as uh, my ornithology textbook described, you know, uh, an example of the medieval droit de seigneur projected onto, onto nature, it is actually the exact opposite. It's the advancement of the most complete kind of sexual autonomy we find in, in nature. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, really rapid. I'm going to go, I'm going to finish with this. This is uh, uh, um, Argus pheasant. Uh, this this uh, is the species that, that Darwin described. And, uh, and this, this video goes on for like 10 minutes. So I'll just let you watch it while while we go to questions. Thanks very much. I know a lot of you have to go, so uh, if you do, 